Hello again to the final video on CTGs. So we're on our last step of CTG assessment from the Dr. C. Bravado mnemonic, and that is overall assessment. So we're going to decide whether the CTG is considered to be normal, suspicious, or pathological. And to do this, we first need to classify our individual characteristics according to the NICE CTG classification system. Now, NICE divides the characteristics into reassuring, non-reassuring, and abnormal. And we're going to be looking at the baseline rate, the baseline variability, and decelerations. So starting with the baseline rate, it is normal and reassuring if it is between 110 to 160 beats per minute. Non-reassuring if at 100 to 109 beats per minute, or 161 to 180 beats per minute, and abnormal if the baseline rate is less than 100 or more than 180. Next, the baseline variability. So reassuring baseline variability is at 5 to 25 beats per minute. It is non-reassuring if less than 5 beats per minute for 30 to 50 minutes, or more than 25 beats per minute for 15 to 25 minutes. And it is abnormal if less than 5 for more than 50 minutes, or more than 25 for more than 25 minutes, or else if it has a sinusoidal pattern. So a pit stop here just to explain what the sinusoidal pattern is all about. So basically, it looks something like this, with a smooth, regular wave-like pattern. It is rare, but very worrying, and associated with a high fetal morbidity and mortality. Okay, so back to our table again. So we've got the decelerations next. So having no or early decelerations is considered reassuring. It's also reassuring when we have variable decelerations with no concerning characteristics for less than 90 minutes. So again, a quick recap here to our decelerations video. So the concerning characteristics of variable decelerations include those which last more than 60 seconds, a biphasic shape, no shouldering present, reduced baseline variability within the deceleration, and failure of the deceleration to return to baseline. Okay, now moving on, we have the non-reassuring features, and these include variable decelerations with no concerning characteristics for more or equal to 90 minutes or variable D-cells with any concerning characteristics in up to 50% of contractions for more or equal to 30 minutes, or variable D-cells with any concerning characteristics in more than 50% of contractions for less than 30 minutes, or late D-cells in more than 50% of contractions for less than 30 minutes. Now, the abnormal features include variable decelerations with any concerning characteristics in more than 50% of contractions for 30 minutes, or late D cells for 30 minutes, or an acute bradycardia, or a single prolonged D cell lasting more or equal to 3 minutes. Okay, so this table is super important when we come to understanding what we need to do with our CTGs. So now that we have our features classified, what next? So if a CTG has all features which are reassuring, this is defined as a normal CTG, and we're fine. We don't need to do anything about it, and we can continue same. Now, if we have one non-reassuring feature and two reassuring features, this is defined as a suspicious CTG, and we should try to perform some conservative measures to correct any possible underlying causes of the suspicious CTG. These may include umbilical cord compression, and in this case, we need to try change position to relieve the pressure of the umbilical cord, typically the left lateral position. Maternal hypotension can also cause changes in the CTG. This can occur, for example, after an epidural is cited, and we correct it by giving IV fluids. And next, we have uterine hyperstimulation, which we can correct by stopping syntocinone to calm down the uterine contractions. So next, if we have one abnormal feature and two non-reassuring features, this is defined now as a pathological CTG. Management of a pathological CTG is very case-dependent. 
We can try to adopt conservative measures again to improve the CTG. We might decide to stimulate the baby by means of fetal scalp stimulation. Or else consider fetal blood sampling or possibly expediting delivery. Okay, so some background. What is fetal scalp stimulation and fetal blood sampling? So firstly, fetal scalp stimulation is when firm pressure is applied on the fetal head. In a healthy baby, this will result in an acceleration on the CTG and is reassuring. But if no stimulation is observed, that is a sign that the baby is not so happy and there may be an element of distress. Next, fetal blood sampling is another test which can perhaps win us some time when we have an abnormal CTG. It essentially involves obtaining a fetal blood sample from the fetal scalp. Then pHs are worked on the sample to assess the level of fetal acidosis and give us an indication whether we can wait or if the fetus is acidotic, then a sign to expedite delivery. Okay, so now that we've got all of this information, let's try to take a look at a few examples. So example number one. So we've got a 29 year old gravida one para zero who's 39 weeks pregnant with no antenatal complications. She had a spontaneous rupture of membranes and she is currently four centimeters dilated. And this is her CTG trace. And of course, we're going to be assessing the CTG using Dr. C. Pravado. So starting off with the fine risk. This is a low risk pregnancy. It sounds like a straightforward pregnancy. She has got two to three contractions in 10 minutes. The baseline rate is at around 130 beats per minute. The baseline variability is more than five beats per minute. Accelerations are present. And she has one small short lasting variable deceleration. So looking at all of these characteristics individually, they are all reassuring. So I'm putting a thumbs up next to them here. That means that overall, this CTG is defined as normal. Okay, next. So moving on to example number two. So next we've got a 35 year old lady in her first pregnancy who is 41 weeks gestation, who underwent an induction of labor. She had no antenatal complications, an artificial rupture of membranes was done and she is currently three centimeters dilated on syntocinon. And here is her CTG trace. So the risk factor in this case is the fact that she is on syntocinon. Looking at the tochometry, she has got five to six contractions in 10 minutes. The baseline rate is at around 150 beats per minute. And the variability is good, more than five beats per minute. Accelerations are present. And there are variable decelerations present with more than 50% of contractions with no concerning characteristics. Why? Because they are short lasting and we can see shouldering occurring in most of the decelerations. So looking again at the characteristics, we have got too many contractions here. So in fact, this is a case of hyperstimulation. Otherwise, we have a good baseline rate with good variability. We have one acceleration present. The variable D cells at this point are classified as reassuring since they are only present on our short 25 minute trace. But of course, if the trace was longer and they are present for more than or equal to 90 minutes, then this will change to a non-reassuring feature. So at this point, the CTG is normal, but again, if variable D cells were present over 90 minutes, then it will be a suspicious CTG. Good. So next we've got a 38 year old in her first pregnancy, having an induction of labor in view of preeclampsia. She has meconium stain lycor and she is six centimeters dilated. And here is her CTG trace. So when we come to defining risk in this case, we have both the fact that she is preeclamptic and the meconium stain lycor, which make this pregnancy high risk. When a fetus passes meconium in utero, that is a sign of fetal distress usually. So then we've got four contractions in 10 minutes. The baseline rate is 170 beats per minute. Variability is less than five beats per minute. Accelerations are absent. 
and we can see late decelerations over here so as you can see the peak of the uterine contraction precedes the dip of the deceleration now here we have the baseline rate variability lack of accelerations and late d cells which are all worrying signs again if this was over a 30 minute trace then the ctg would be classified as abnormal and steps need to be taken to try to improve the ctg or the liver Okay, so our last example, we've got a 29-year-old, Gravida 2 para 1, 38 weeks with no antenatal complications, who is currently 5 cm dilated. And here is her CTG. So again, this is considered a low-risk pregnancy. She has 4 contractions in 10 minutes. She initially has a baseline rate of 145 beats per minute, with a good variability of more than 5 beats per minute. Accelerations are absent. Now, initially in the trace, there are variable decelerations with more than 50% of contractions with concerning characteristics. So we can see the biphasic shape, the W shape of the decelerations over here. We can see a prolonged variable deceleration lasting more than 60 seconds over here. It's lasting around two minutes. We have a D cell with a prolonged recovery time to baseline over here. So these are all concerning characteristics. But then we have a bradycardia, where the baseline rate has gone to around 80 beats per minute for six minutes so far. So when we talk about acute bradycardia, as we talk about the 36912 rule. By three minutes of the bradycardia, we need to call for help. By six minutes, we need to move the patient to theater. By nine minutes, we need to prepare for delivery. And by 12 minutes, we need to aim to have the baby delivered. So that's how fast you need to act with an acute bradycardia. So of course, the CTG is abnormal. Okay, so finally, that's it about CTGs. I really hope that these three videos have helped you. If you have any questions, just ask in the comments. Please like and subscribe.